if there's a drug that you ever want, it's that drug of creating something that people love. I'm not sure there's a better drug. Hi everybody, how are you going today? Yes, it is so good to see you. It's so good to be here. It's so good to have the opportunity to do what I do. And it's so good to have had the opportunity to have done what I've done over all of these decades. And this video, as you would have seen the title, it's 17 things you need to do to be a great photographer. Let's roll the credits. What are the 17 things that you need to do to be an amazing photographer? Whether you are a hobbyist or a professional, it just doesn't matter. These are the essential things that you need. And if you don't have them, you've got no chance. You've got a snowflake soap in hell. Okay, you know what? There is no 17 things you need to do to be a great photographer. That's ridiculous. There is a, an extremely large number of things that any human being needs to do in order to be successful as an artist. Which photographers are both great artists and technicians. That's what I love. One of the many things I love about being a photographer it is, it, it is that it's equally left brain and right brain. What am I talking about today? Seeing as the title was just pretend because I wanted to make a bit of a joke about the 17, the nine, the five, the three, the seven, the two things you must have in your bag and the 48 things you gotta know in order to be able to. That's not how I roll. That's not how I roll. I, I, I wanna dig a little bit deeper than those five, 17, nine or 12 or 11 things and dig into the fact that it is about our humanity which ultimately drives whether you end up being successful in this space. And then there's another question around success. What is the definition of success? Is success you being happy with what you do? Is success others being happy with what you do? Is success making money from it and being more than a hobbyist, being a professional. The measure of success is also extremely subjective. So how is it that we can have a defined set of rules that's going to make any one person successful and that those rules then answer the, the questions to their needs of happiness? So where does this all end us? Ultimately, I've just said there, it could be anything for anybody, sure. So the best way that I can share with you a trajectory is to share my trajectory. How did I get to this point? What are the internal cogs and workings that made me me? And I think a lot of it is what makes you, you. Why did I start? Why did I begin? What motivated me to even pick up a camera? Like, well, why did I even do it in the first place? I just wanna share with you today a little insight into how I got from A to M. Because I feel like I'm only halfway through the alphabet. I still got a long way to go. So specifically drilling into how, why and how did I become most well known as a streetscape photographer? Well, I had worked out, as I had said, as I have said before, that I did enjoy very much the visual arts. So I did understand when I was 12, 13, Blade Runner came out, I was 11, 1982, that I liked the visual arts. I liked the power of the frame. So early on, I understood the frame and what it could do. Then a few years later, 14, 15 years of age, I started to realize that the city that I lived in was a very, very beautiful place and I couldn't see that beauty being represented. And I kind of thought, why? I would literally walk out the door, I'd be on a train, I'd be on my bike and I'd go, this looks stunning. Why is nobody capturing it? 
And that's where my journey began. And around that time, I, uh, I, was doing, mm, I was doing what we call an elective subject at school. I did like, I don't know, I did like eight classes after school, one semester, one term. That was it. But from that, I was given a camera, not given a camera, I was given a camera to use. And I started to take photographs of this city that I lived in and a seed of passion came from that. So what might that be for you? What is the seed for passion for you? There might be a turning point where you saw a car or you saw a bird or you saw a sunset, a snowflake, all these different things. And you captured an image and you were inspired by that image. That image inspired you, it gave you joy. And it's that little spark of joy you probably got joy when you took the photo. You're actually enjoying the process of learning the camera, the process of finding your frame and working out look, what looked beautiful. And a lot of that you would have just done innately. It just happened. So you had that, you had that time, you had that moment when you actually created the image. And then at some point, depending on when you started. If it's the digital age, you might have seen it on the screen straight away. And if it was when I started, I, I used to have to send slides, slide, transparency film to Kodak. Kodak would process it 10, 12, two weeks later, you'd get a little plastic box full of slides. You'd have to put them in the slide projector and then you'd see them up on the wall. What an amazing Mad Men style moment to actually have the carousel of images projected onto the wall. And that was the next defining moment in the journey of saying, wow, you, me, we can create. We can have this beautiful time at the time of creation. And in photography, unlike say painting, photography, we have the moment where we create the image. And then we have the moment where we see the image without the static, without the noise that's around you when you create the image. And they're two very different experiences. There's been a few times in my career where I've taken the shot and in that moment, I've, I, when I've actually just been here and taken the shot, I've gone, that's a cracker. But so many times you don't really know until later on. And sometimes the shot is way more than you thought it was gonna be. And sometimes it's less than you thought it was gonna be. And that's a, I think that's one of the biggest joys of photography is the, the moment of creation and then the moment of revelation, the reveal. It's lovely. And it's, each art form's different. Like with music, you're playing it and you're inventing it as you go and there it is. So we've all got our different processes. So I started with that beautiful cycle of taking the photo, getting the outcome and getting really personally very, very excited about it. And that's all it was in the beginning. And that's all it is for any of us. It might be that nobody else really enjoys our work in the beginning. And that's cool because the most important person for you to impress is you. It's pretty logical, isn't it? There's no one else. There's, there's, there's no one else you need to impress. It doesn't need to be your parents. It doesn't need to be your mother. It doesn't need to be your wife. It doesn't need to be your husband. You don't have to impress anyone. You impress yourself first. And there's a good chance, I think, there's a good chance if it runs a shiver down your spine when you're looking at your work, then it's probably going to run a shiver down somebody else's spine. And that's where the next part of the journey begins. And that's up to you. The next part of the journey is up to you, whether you need to or whether you want to present your work to a wider audience. You don't have to. Back when I started, it was very difficult to present your work to a wider audience. You had to either be in a gallery or that was about it. There was no such thing as social media. There was no Instagram, no Facebook, no YouTube, no websites. It's extraordinarily difficult for us to wrap our heads around that notion in 2020. There was no place you could just put your work up and, the, and it would be aggregated to the world if the correct keyword was typed in. And I wasn't even sure when I started, there was no concept of this being monetized. Didn't exist to me. I was just simply doing it 
because I loved the city, I loved what I saw, I loved the process and the whole thing was self-perpetuating simply on the passion, simply on the energy. How did it go to the next step? People started to say to me, Matt, I love your work, can I have it? And I said, yes, you can, and I gave it away. And then after a little while, it was like, huh, well, they're my friends, that's nice. Can I do this in the real world? Can I do this to an audience I don't know? Can I do this to an audience that is not biased? And that is where the first test began. So in 1990, I decided to go to an open air market, put my work in front of the general public and see how they reacted. The most terrifying thing, one of the most, besides escaping from a helicopter underwater, but yes, in all seriousness, one of the most terrifying things that I've ever done. And of course, if you choose to do something like this, how do you do it? I was 19, 18 or 19 years of age, didn't have very much money at all, and I had to work out how do I do this in an affordable fashion. So this is part of what your journey is going to be if you want to put it in front of people. And this is what this stuff is here for. One of the very first products that I created was these mounted images. And why did I create this product? Because it was very, very affordable. I was able to create these images and I did everything in-house. So in my world and in your world, one of the efficiencies are most important. And Elon Musk talks about it a lot in, uh, in, in making cars. You've got to have efficiencies and economies of scale and parts that you can reuse. And I know this seems to be a bit of a sidestep from talking about feelings and emotions, but if you're going to run a business and start something like this, you've got to have all the logical stuff in play. And that's why I'm talking about why I love photography, because it's both left brain and right brain. It's both creative and logical and technical at the same time. Everything, in the beginning, everything I did by hand, I, I actually bought plastic from a plas directly from a plastic manufacturer and it was plastic used to wrap pot plants, would you believe, and things like that. And then I would just hand wrap, I, I would buy it in. So everything that I could, if I could buy it in industrial quantities and industrial strength, it ends up being like one tenth the cost. Sure, you've got to buy 10 times more, but it's one tenth the cost. So you end up absolutely saving in the long run. And that's what manufacture, in the end, this is just another version of manufacturing. So I, I would buy the packaging in quantities, I would buy the mount board in a pack of 50, which, you know, I think I remember the first time I was out of pocket something like $500, but I was able to make 300 of these mounts. If I remember correctly, I could get six from each mount, yeah, 300 of these mounts. And that's what I did. So I was able to drive the price of these things down, get to a market where there was low overheads. I printed these things myself in my own dark room. I'd buy the paper in boxes of 250, which was the cheapest way you could buy the paper. And these were the parts. I even bought the sticky tape that I put it all together, Scotch magic tape. I bought that in bulk from a wholesaler. Had to buy, again, 20 packs at a time. But once you bit the bullet the first time and you got all that stuff the first time, you were making a profit from that point and it would never hurt ever again. That's how I got started. And I was at a market to go back to that first market. I'm there at dawn. I'm setting it all up. I've managed to get some walls from a mate. Some, they were actually office dividers, which, we, which had little feet. And because we were outside, we had to extend the feet because the feet were like about a foot because they were never in the wind because they were inside. And we had to extend those feet to be two meters so they wouldn't blow over. So a guy down the road helped us out with that, did that. Then I had to work out a system to attach pictures to an office divider. So I worked out a chain system. So we wrapped a chain around it. So then you could put hooks wherever you wanted. I was young, I was keen, and I put it, and we set it all up, and then I stood there, I was so nervous and so shy, I could not face the general public. So I stood there, basically for the first few hours, kind of like this, 
And then I had, my, I had my trestle table set up in front and it had the mounts on it and it had a few cards. I'd, ha I'd handmade my own greeting cards by printing a photo on the front, then turning around in the larger, printing a photo on the back and I made these greeting cards. I'll see if I can find some. I actually have no idea where they are, but these were the most beautiful creations. And someone said, can I please have this? And there was $5 for a card. And they bought and I sold my very first thing. Now, what's interesting about me telling this story is April 15th, which as of recording this is about 10 days away. April 15th is the official anniversary it's the 30 year birthday of the first sale to the general public of one of my images. So I share this because this is, this, this is the 30th birthday of who I am. And that's a profound thing for me to say. Because as a 19 year old, when I started 18, 19, I didn't know who I was. But this is actually the 30th birthday of who I am. Those first 19 years, that was the exploration to get to that starting point of the person who I've now become. And those people who gave me their money in that very first Sunday that I was set up at that market, they, those people, if I only knew who they were today, I would find them and I would hug them, I would track them down, I would give them my book, whatever I could do, and I would say thank you for helping me on my trajectory for where I am today. It is so profound that I have been able to live my dream, and I, and I have. And I, I, I don't want to be shy or bashful or ashamed about that. I've worked very hard for my dream. I know a lot of people don't get to live their dream, but I've also taken so much risk. And so that's another big part of the journey. I know we joked at the start of this about the 17 things you must do, but there is definitely one thing you must do. You must take risk. You cannot drag yourself out, up and beyond into the stratosphere without risk. How did man break the sound barrier? How did humanity get to the moon, et cetera, et cetera. Risk, it's all risk. And so in my world, it was having a part-time job. I was doing the hustle. I was working at a barman at the MCG, which is our giant gladiatorial football stadium. I was selling beers to drunk people. But that was my hustle because it was paying for all of this to happen in the start. But I can tell you, that first Sunday was $95 and then the next one was $200 and then on it went from there. And pretty quickly, as a 19 year old, I was in a position where I didn't need more than being able to pursue my artistic career. So you have to be courageous. There is no question this takes courage. And can I tell you, as much as even your closest loved ones love you, nobody's in your head. Nobody understands your dream. Nobody understands what you really want. And, and what that ultimately means is no one is going to help you actually get there. There'll be people around the side that support, but they can't get you over the line. I'd like to say that more profoundly than I just did, but I can't right now. But the reality is, it's your heart, it's your dream, and, and no one is ever locked into your heart. That's just, it's such a rare experience for someone to be locked into your heart and your dream. So if you're ever feeling that the people around you don't get it, that's normal. Do not worry about it. That's so normal. And then when you spread your wings and fly, you know they'll be there. You know they'll be there for you. And then they'll be really excited. But there might be a lot of days where they've kind of got no idea what you're on about. And that's okay. You've got to stick with that dream. It is so important. 
So just keep in mind, tip number 438 or wherever the hell we're up to, people don't really, a lot of the time people don't get our journey. And so you've just got to be strong and be bold and hold the line. And then after all of this effort, after all of this toil, one of the biggest joys of then being a professional artist or a hobbyist or an enthusiast, it doesn't matter what you're called, it's absolutely irrelevant, is the shared experience. We are without a question, without a doubt, and it's, 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 it's so difficult in these current times, we are pack animals. We want to be together, we want to share things, stories, love, hugs, whatever it is. So the best part that's come out of all of this and you know, YouTube's another chapter in all of this is the shared experience. For me to be able to create something like these guys here that uh, you can actually watch a video up here where, where I created this on camera, not knowing that this was gonna happen. And this only happened a month or so ago, shared experience. Another part of the shared experience with this image is the fact that th thank you for the person who lent me this lens that got me out there to create this art, another shared experience. So, as human beings, it just doesn't get better than all of that sharing. Someone's shared and had faith in me that to, to look after their thing I get to share the experience of creating it and then ultimately as a creator, the end product is shared and people love it or like it. But that has been the part that's touched my heart the most is to be able to create something that people love. And 30 years of creating this stuff and having people say, wow, whatever they say. This is, I'm not saying this <laughs> from an ego perspective. I'm saying this, if there's a drug that you ever want, it's that drug of creating something that people love. I'm not sure there's a better drug. So if there's anything that you should be trying to pursue, I know we talk about gear, and I'll just put this disclaimer in, there's nothing wrong with talking about gear and looking at the best gear and all the reasons why gear is fun and all that sort of stuff. But if there's one thing you really should be trying to chase, it's that shared experience, the connecting with a fellow human being, them connecting with your vision, your heart, your soul, and you connecting with them through your art. It's truly profound and it, it just never, it never gets any better than that. A lot of this can simply be, a, lo a lot of what we do to get to a point like creating a piece of art like this, it, it is just simply the journey. I don't want to sound twee, but sometimes the journey is super exciting as well. I've had many, a, many an occasion where the getting ready for a shoot, the, the driving to a location, the, the preparing, the thinking, all of that stuff is the shared experience with people you do it with. Check out this video here. I went on the Trans-Mongolian Railway all the way from Beijing to St. Petersburg. And it was an amazing trip of a lifetime but some of the fondest parts of my memories of that are the people. The people who I met on that journey. I've never seen any of them ever again, but that's not the point. They were amazing experiences, amazing people, and we shared this experience together. So sometimes the journey is just as good. Don't be too focused on the outcomes all the time. Outcomes take a long time. To go back to the fact it's a hard road I have compressed a very small part of my story into just a very short space of time. But the reality is I was toiling with photography for six or seven years before I made my first cent. And then from the moment that I made my first dollar from photography, it was another two or three years before it became something big enough for me to be able to support myself with. So these things take time. They take time. Don't be hard on yourself. Remember the little things. Remember the joy and circle back. Why are you even here? Why are you watching? Why do you love photography? Why do you go out 
if you like wildlife, why do you go out early in the morning? If you like astrophotography, why are you out in the middle of the night, in the middle of an empty paddock, taking the photo of stars? Why are you doing it? It's because you love that. You love that. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. And all the bits that come after that, well, that is the product, that is the mechanism of the capitalistic society that we live in and that is about monetization and that's another whole kind of i feel like they're just two completely separate entities but never lose sight of your passion your love your goals your dreams why you're there your humanity everything that drives you to create your art and separate it clearly from the monetization side of it don't let one influence the other from a staying motivated perspective because of course one influences the other from a can i afford it perspective but we're talking about our hearts today we're not talking about gear i'd love to hear what motivates you to get up early in the morning to get up late at night if you photograph wild animals to lie in the mud for all, all day long what why are you there what motivates you please let me know in the comments below Thanks so much for being here today. Please subscribe if it's your first time. Please share. Please like. And please look after yourselves. It's been so lovely sharing.